And when the officer came back, the DNA evidence was gone. <laughs> hey, all you kids out there, welcome back to the Deep Discog Dive. We've got a great show coming up for you today. Our contestants are all here. Look at them. They look like they could eat any item off the Dunkin' Donuts menu and live to tell the tale. Contestant number one. First question, give me your favorite U.S. state abbreviation, your favorite note of the major scale, and your favorite model of car made by Kia. Oh my gosh, this was my favorite question growing up. Today, we're talking about De La Soul. Let's dive in. Oh, it's really bad. The day, the law, and the soul. Amityville, Long Island, New York, 1987. Three cool cats met in high school. Kelvin Mercer, David Jude Joliker, and Vincent Mason. They started hanging out, kicking back, and making music. Their stage names all came from in-jokes. Kelvin's was Postanus, his DJ name Soundsop spelled backwards. David's was Trugoy the Dove. Trugoy is yogurt, David's favorite food, spelled backwards. Vincent's was Pacemaster Mace. Unfortunately, this is not a Sam Retsame Sap spelled backwards. Pacemaster was a substitute for for DJ, and Mace was a shortening of his last name. Vincent has also said that he thought of Mace as an acronym for making a soul effort. In later years, though, he would also have the nickname of Maceo, and that one has seemed to stick more, so it's what I'll call him from here on out. The group's name was De La Soul, which translated to From the Soul and comes from an old Stetsa Sonic song, Rock De La Stet. Speaking of which, their first demo tape, Plug Tune-In, found its way to producer Prince Paul, who was the leader of Stetsa Sonic. Paul liked what he heard, and so he and the trio met up to flesh out Plug Tune-In and other songs. Soon enough, De La Soul were signed to Tommy Boy Records off the strength of a three-track demo, including Plug Tune-In. They got the green light for their first album, which would be co-produced by Prince Paul. The early concept for this album was music beamed down from Mars via three microphone plugs. This idea did not come to fruition, but it did give the trio another set of nicknames. Kelvin was Plug 1, David was Plug 2, and Vincent was Plug 3. In March 1989, De La Soul made their debut with Three Feet High and Rising, my favorite combination of height measurement and elevation status. Okay, first, I gotta say, the production on this thing is dense. It feels like these four guys pulled bits and pieces from every album they had ever heard in their lives. If you do listen to this one and are interested, it's definitely worth checking out the full list of samples. It's remarkable where and how these guys pulled from other songs. The magic number sounds like the opening credits to a classic Nickelodeon show, and it combines the melody from Multiplication Rock with a Led Zeppelin drum beat. Buddy is a giant posse cut with members of the Native Tongues, a collective De La Soul were a part of. Jungle Brothers, Queen Latifah, and Q-Tip. He sounds good here, though I kinda hope he finds his own group, his own tribe, if you will. I, I don't know what he'd call it, though. Me, Myself, and I was the record's most popular song. The lyrics are about denying labels that others put on you, and it's got the sick as hell synth line on the chorus. It's just me, myself, and I. I Know has Postanus and Trugoy hitting on this girl, and it jams together danceable samples from Otis Redding, Sly and the Family Stone, and... Steely Dan? Oh, I love Steely Whether it's Change and Speak, Tread Water, Say No Go, Daisy Age, etc., the album will have you grooving and beaming all the way through, making you feel like the coolest man in your local scrap metal yard. And in between songs, we've got skits. Based on what I've read, Three Feet High and Rising was the first major rap album to incorporate, or at least popularize, skits. Now these days, skits have a pretty mixed reception. Three Feet High's skits are thankfully well done and honestly pretty funny. They mostly revolve around a game show format with the host played by Al Watts, one of the album's engineers, and the contestants played by De La Soul and Prince Paul. Hello, my name is Plug One, and um, um, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I like Twizzlers, and I've been my favorite drama movie is Blood Sucking Freaks, just like your mama. My only real complaint isn't anything to do with the album. It's more just my own personal preferences. It, it's long. It's over an hour. On one hand, the relaxed runtime lends itself well for this kind of album. It feels like good buddies just kicking back and having fun. On the other hand, though, I'm an impatient idiot. Who would win in a fight? But again, that's up to personal preference, and it does not do anything to diminish the quality of Three Feet High and Rising. It's a stellar album, and I highly recommend you check it out.
De La Soul's debut album rose way past three feet high when it was released. Audiences loved it, critics loved it, Me, Myself, and I was a pretty big hit. It also led some to coin this as the start of the Daisy Age, named after Three Feet High's closing track and standing for the Inner Sound, y'all. Plus, it made them prominent representatives of the native tongues, which gained even more prominence when other members put out successful albums. Despite the praise and platform, though, De La Soul found plenty of frustration on the path to fame. Remember Me, Myself, and I from a minute ago, and how that was about rejecting societal labels? That wasn't made up. A lot of people looked at De La's attire and overall vibe and said, oh, these guys are hippies. This was a typecasting that the group wasn't too fond of. A big turning point was when they performed on the Arsenio Hall show in 1989, and he introduced them as such. To call them the hippies of hip hop. So what? They just wanted to live honestly and freely. Sue them. Lawyers representing the mainstays of the Turtles filed suit on July 13th in U.S. District Court against the members of the popular rap trio De La Soul. You see, the track transmitting live from Mars happened to sample a little bit of You Showed Me by the Turtles. And for whatever reason, that sample was not cleared. No matter how you toss the dice, it had to be settled in court. The only one for them was a win, and a win for them, so happy together. This court win was not just a bummer for De La Soul, but it was also a precursor to a much larger case that would effectively change how sampling could be done going forward. But hey, even with some roadblocks, De La Soul were still living large, and when it came time to record Three Feet High's follow-up, they wanted to subvert expectations of what they were. And thankfully, Tommy Boy Records was pretty supportive of their efforts since Three Feet High was such a success. In May 1991, we found out that De La Soul is dead. So that's a fun title, right? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so excited to announce my next venture my total demise. Many people saw Three Feet High as a rebellion from the rap music of the time, but that wasn't really an active goal of the group when making the record. De La Soul is Dead, on the other hand, wears that subtext proudly, especially the cover art that shows dead daisies. As I've said before, I'm always eager to hear an artist's immediate follow-up to a very successful record, especially if they use the opportunity to get freaky. De La's second album, does not get freaky. It's still very heavy on sampling, and in many places, it's as fun-loving as ever. The first real track, Oodles of O's, has this woozy bass line that unnerves me, but also kind of hypnotizes me. It also has a rhyme scheme where basically every line ends with a word that ends in an O sound, thus giving the song its name. A roller skating jam named Saturdays is this disco-infused party track. It's the most upbeat song on here. I also love how it samples Frankie Valli's Grease. No need to talk, Luke, you just walked in. Biddy's in the BK Lounge has Postanus rapping about girls who are bashing a Burger King employee, then Kazoo's for 20 seconds, and suddenly the girls in Postanus are rap battling. That said, do not go into this expecting a totally lighthearted affair. De La Soul do find moments to be more critical or self-aware. For starters, there's the intro. These kids find this album in the trash, then some lowlife jerks beat them up to get it. The rest of the album has them acting as the Muppets critics, interjecting every so often to bash the album. Then there's Pass the Plugs, which directly calls out Arsenio Hall. There are also a couple of songs that delve into much darker topics. My Brother's a Basshead, for example, which depicts drug addiction and its impact on Postanus's family. And who could forget Millie pulled a pistol on Santa? Seriously, it's hard to forget. It's a story about a girl who takes revenge on an abusive father who works as a mall Santa. It's surreal, it's twisted, but it's delivered with enough levity to not be a major buzzkill. Overall, De La Soul is Dead is worth checking out, but its main value to me personally is that it's a reflection of the impact of Three Feet High on the group. At the time, De La Soul's sonic death was received well, though not as well as their debut. Which is a bummer. You only get to pull the death card once, and after that it's just diminishing returns. Okay, I know I've said it like five times already, but this time I really am dying, you guys. Shut up and give us the Mac Miller DDD! In later years, though, the collective opinion did improve, and now this is viewed as one of the group's best albums. Still, getting this stuff off their chest didn't really fix De La Soul's typecasting, nor did it fix the group's outlook on the music industry. 
industry. Oh well, time to double down. As of September 1993, De La Soul were in a balloon mind state. So we've seen De La Soul happy, we've seen them jaded. Where does Balloon Mind State find them? Yes. I don't know if Balloon Mind State is a happier record than De La Soul is Dead, but I think any bitterness within the group has been pushed back to subtext. In its place is a casual weariness, if that makes sense. It's a feeling that's best described with the mantra that appears multiple times on this record. It might blow up, but it won't go pop. It might blow up, but it won't go pop. I think De La Soul still found themselves in a tense place between who they were and how others perceived them, but they had also discovered ways to expertly navigate that tension. All of this may lead you to expect a dense and laborious listen, but you need to know that this bangs in the whip. Its biggest sonic distinction from the past two records is its jazz-influenced production. It's like you walked into this basement jazz club and the owner is a dressed out man named Grandmaster Pappy who welcomes you in and blows a big cloud of cigar smoke in your face. and then. Someone took that cigar smoke, pressed it onto vinyl, and called it Balloon Mind State. Lead single Break of Dawn is kind of a rags to riches track, but one that focuses on the sacrifices made to earn said riches. An interesting spin on this kind of story. It also makes great work of sampling Michael Jackson and Smokey Robinson. Patty Dookie features a live band backed by the horn section from James Brown's band. Long Island Wilden features two Japanese MCs, Shadara Par and Takaki Khan. Ego Trip in Part 2 has funny yelling. <laughs> Balloon Mind State is a phenomenal record, but there's no way I could say I like it more than Three Feet High and Rising. Oh, wait a second. It's only 48 minutes long? We should move on before I say anything else. Balloon Mind State received critical acclaim like any 48 minute long album should, but it was not a sales success. In March 1994, De La gave us the Clear Lake Auditorium EP, its four tracks from Balloon Mind State, and two unreleased tracks, Shocking Female MCs with A Tribe Called Quest, and Sticks and Stones with Brand New Heavies. It's very cool to see Brand New Heavies existing before they entered my life by soundtracking the trailer for Happy Feet. Making their fourth record felt like a do or die situation for the group. Other acts like Wu-Tang Clan were coming in, and popularizing a sound that De La just didn't do. It really felt like the stakes were high. And in July 1996, those stakes entered the grammatically incorrect present with Stakes Is High. If Balloon Mind State was a brief reprieve from Dead's outward jadedness, Stakes Is High puts us right back into it. So much so, in fact, that this is De La Soul's first album without Prince Paul. The group didn't think he matched the mood of the album, and they instead decided to produce this one almost entirely by themselves. Don't worry though, the decision was amicable, and Prince Paul went to go do his own stuff for a bit. It's funny too, because some of their Native Tongues fellows released an album the year before that was similarly jaded. I wasn't super in love with that record, but somehow, I really enjoyed Stakes Is High. Across this album, De La Soul look at hip-hop as a whole and say, I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. That spirit is best embodied on the title track, or as I like to call it, one of the best songs De La Soul has ever made. These horns play the same note on the downbeat while the bass line changes. The feeling it creates for me is so confident that it gets close to ominous, like De La are about to lay waste over the entire rap game. It really makes you feel like stakes is high. It certainly helps too that this was one of the first major releases produced by Jay Dilla. Super MCs bemoans the lack of true star MCs, underscored by these low-pitched keys and unsettling chime sounds, the business champion's state of mind and lyrical prowess over materialism and gaudy displays of wealth, dog eat dog bashes the dog eating his dogs in this dog eat dog eating dog world, woof, big brother beat marks the first major appearance by future rap heavyweight and be kind rewind star, most deaf, and while their lyrics are still as cynical as the rest of the album, songs like Once Again Long Island and Four More carry a sonic levity that's comparable to Three Feet High. You may also notice a common thread across this album's interludes. Nearly all of them have different people talking about their first times hearing Criminal Minded by Boogie Down Productions. Apparently this idea came about just because the guys wanted some way to properly kick off the album, but it lends credence to the album's pining for a better hip-hop scene. I admit I was worried about Prince Paul's absence, but Stakes is High is a damn good De La Soul album. Stakes is high. Reviews is high. 
sales is not high. De La Soul's fourth record continued their streak of immense critical praise paired with lackluster sales. It also inspired diss tracks. That shocks me. Imagine these guys ruining your life. Yeah, see, he can't do it. But alas, Tupac's Against All Odds was inspired by feelings towards the ego trip in music video. And Treach from Naughty by Nature held a years long grudge because of a name drop on Stakes is High's intro track. A talker of the bird without weed ah. influence, so stick to your Naughty by Nature's ah. and your cane, cause graffiti that are based upon the wax. Ah. Later on, De La said both instigating instances were not meant to be attacks. The next four years would be pretty quiet for De La Soul. Aside from a good number of shows, the only release from them was Stay Away, featuring Pete Rock and Rob O. But in 2000, De La Soul announced they would be releasing a three-disc concept album named Art Official Intelligence. Though for whatever reason, this plan for one three-disc album eventually switched to three separate albums under the AOI moniker. And in August 2000, we got the first installment, Mosaic Thump. The cover implies a sci-fi aesthetic, which is new for De La Soul, but hey, that could be cool. Plus, Stakes is High proved De La Soul could have great production without Prince Paul. Does Mosaic Thump continue that trend? Uh, no. The production's not bad by any means, but it absolutely feels of its time. It sounds like any sort of party club music you might hear in the early 2000s. During an interview for this record, Trugoy said this was their attempt to just have a good time and throw a big party, which is backed up by the sheer number of guests on here. This is the biggest guest roster of any De La record so far. I think Mosaic Thump succeeds at that for sure, but as a result, I don't feel any strong emotions towards these songs. If you put a gun to my head and asked me for my favorite tracks off this album, I'd probably say Ooh with Red Man and Prince Paul on production, Through Ya City, which brings Jay Dilla back, All Good with Shaka Khan, The Art of Getting Jumped. After that, if you asked me for one more, I would just say, It's been a great run, I'll see you in the next life. Honestly, the real highlights from this album for me are the skits, the three ghostweed skits specifically. The setup is that by smoking ghostweed, you turn into a certain rapper. And this is how we get to hear verses from Pharaoh Monk, Fife Dog, and Black Thought. They're pretty funny. Aside from that though, I didn't hate it. I'm sure plenty of people like it, but I would personally recommend you check out other De La Soul albums before this one. While critical reception was unusually mixed for a De La Soul record, Mosaic Thump did see an uptick in commercial sales. It also got some chart attention with two of its singles, and the album itself peaked at number 9 on the Billboard Top 200. And luckily, De La got to strike while the iron was hot, because just over a year later, in December 2001, the second installment of AOI dropped. Bionics. It is effectively more of what Mosaic Thump was giving us, and I am effectively giving it the same reaction as that record, which is, eh. It's more of the same smoothed over 2000s R&B production from Mosaic Thump, and again, most of it was enjoyable on the surface, but didn't leave much. I, I, I'm sorry, stop the music. What the hell was that sample? Excuse me, excuse me. Is this song simply rocking a sample of Paul McCartney and Wings' Wonderful Christmas Time? I am only slightly throwing up in my mouth. Not only am I disgusted by this flip, I am also disgusted by how much I like it. The moon is right after all. Other highlights for me included Baby Fat, Hell Down, Am I Worth You. There are also these Reverend Do Good skits that pop up. And they're okay. Though on Reverend Do Good number three, we get the return of Ghostweed, where a teenager smokes it and transforms into Jay Dilla. It's that easy? I think I enjoyed Bionics a little bit more than Mosaic Thump, though it's mostly because the high spots are higher. But again, I wouldn't recommend checking this out unless you've got other De La records under your belt. Bionics carried in Mosaic Thump's steps of having mixed critical reactions from fans and critics, but it also carried in most other De La Soul albums' steps by not selling well. Doesn't help that Baby Fat was the only single released for the album. There were plans to release more singles, but before any of that could happen, Tommy Boy Records ended its joint venture with Warner Records. The master tapes of all Tommy Boy albums released up to that point stayed with Warner Music, and Tommy Boy's artists were shopped around to Warner's different subsidiaries. Soon after, De La decided to go independent and started their own imprint, 
AOI Records. Said imprint was managed under a division of Sanctuary Records, which was led by Matthew Knowles, aka Beyonce's dad. Their first release after Bionics was in 2002, when they contributed a song to... Parappa the Rapper 2? I need to hear you say you gotta believe! Oh my god, the absolute taste of this collab, the panache, the ear feel. This game was one of my favorites as a kid, and I had no idea De La ever did a song for it. Very cool. And we must not forget their other classic track from that year, Sibling Rivalries off Dexter's Laboratory The Hip Hop Experiment. But among their future plans, now that they were on their own, was the third installment of Artificial Intelligence. And in October 2004, we did get that third AOI record, though the title could have used a spell check. The grind date in October 2004. So let's make this clear right off the bat. This is an AOI 3. This album was initially going to be AOI 3, but as the project developed, the gang decided to make it its own thing. Thus, De La Soul ended up being the 2000s rap equivalent to Sufjan Stevens, moving on from a multi-album project after only two releases. But honestly, I don't mind that at all, because the grind date is great. It puts one foot back into De La Soul's retro sample sound, but also brings in a bit of 2000s chipmunk soul. The result is a more modern sounding De La that doesn't veer so so far into sounding dated. Not to mention, the group as a whole sounds so much more energized than before. This is the leanest, meanest De La record since Balloon Mind State, and I love that for it and for me. Shopping Bags She Got From You was the lead single. It's another De La song that criticizes wealth and materialism, but this time it's got a beat produced by Mad Lib. He also produced Come On Down, and he gels quite well with De La Soul. We've also got producers like Jay Dilla again on Much More, Ninth Wonder on Church, and Super Dave West on basically everything else. Oh, and I gotta mention the guests, too. Ghostface, Common, Flava Flav, Sean Paul, even MF Doom. He's on the penultimate track, Rock Cocaine Flow, and he sounds great with the gang. I especially love the way the track speeds up and slows down in certain sections. I'm a fan like the partridges, pardon him for the mix-up, battle for your Tory cartridges. The Grind Date is a great project. If any poor soul had tried to convince us that De La had lost it in any way, this album would prove their heresy. The water is three feet high and rising! Following The Grind Date, we would have to wait 12 whole years for the next official De La Soul album. Of course, I'm using the royal we there. Back then, I personally was waiting for like... Mario Kart DS or something. In a sort of twisted way, this would end up being the most high-profile period of De La Soul's existence since Three Feet High and Rising, and it all kicked off in May 2005 with arguably the most famous song that De La Soul had ever been a part of. In fact, I guarantee you, after they were done writing their part for this song, spilling that ink must have felt good. <laughs> In 2005, De La Soul were the featured artist on Feel Good Inc., the biggest hit by fictional cartoon band slash Damon Albarn musical project, Gorillaz. The group was brought late into the production of Gorillaz' then upcoming album Demon Days, but were initially planned to be on Kids With Guns. At the last minute though, they looked at Feel Good Inc. and said, you know what this needs? Terrifying laughter. The laughing at the beginning and end was done by Maceo, and the verse was done by Trugoy. I think this verse is a classic by now, right? It certainly feels like it, at least for someone of my demographic. In October 2006, there was the Impossible Mission TV Series Part 1, a compilation of unreleased tracks from over the past 15 years. This one is not officially available these days, but you can find it easily on YouTube. The next two projects are interesting. You could possibly make the claim that one or both of them are official De La Soul albums. In fact, Wikipedia considers one of them as such. I personally think there's enough setting them apart to put them outside of the canon, but they are still worth mentioning. In April 2009, we got Are You In Nike Plus Original Run. This project came from a shoe collab De La Soul did with Nike. In tandem, the group teamed up with producer Flashdramas for an iTunes exclusive mixtape, one that was designed for runners as one continuous 44-minute mix. And you know what? It's fine. Yeah, whether you're running in your neighborhood or running from your own thoughts, this is a fine way to soundtrack 44 minutes. I especially want to give kudos to the back-to-back -back tracks Attack of the Stet and Pick Up the Pace Run. Both feature electric guitar in a really prominent way that I haven't heard in other De La Soul songs so far. Take a 
The main things keeping it from the halls of De La Valhalla are its inception as a side project under the Nike umbrella, and the fact that it is also not readily available in any official manner these days. Though again, you can find it with a quick YouTube search. As a quick aside, in 2010, the group reunited with Gorillaz for Super Fast Jellyfish off of the album Plastic Beach, really fun track that shows off De La's sense of humor. The second noteworthy project was Plug One and Plug Two present First Serve in April 2012. As the title implies, this record has just Postanus and Trugoy with production handled by French producers Chocolat and Khalid Filali. Apparently, the two producers came up with the concept of the record and then invited Pas and Trugoy to fill the roles. Why was Maceo not a part of this record? Mostly because he didn't need to be. The project already had two DJs, which is a bit unfortunate because if Maceo was a part of it, and if this was a proper official De La Soul record, this would be one of their best. All right, time for a pop quiz. Remember when I said Poss and Trugoy were filling roles? That's because First Serve is a concept album following two fictional rappers. Poss is Jacob Pop Life Barrow, and Trugoy is Dean Witter. When the album starts, they're freestyling in one of their mom's basements. By the end, they're headlining shows in France. Compared to proper De La Records, the production takes way more cues from funk, soul, and gospel. And it is glorious. I dare you to make it through tracks like The Work, Must Be The Music, We Made It, Move Em In, Move Em Out, and not have a giant grin on your face. Highly recommend this album. The last project I want to mention is 2014's Smell The Daisy, a mixtape released on SoundCloud. It's got lyrics from past De La Soul songs wrapped over unreleased J. Dilla beats. My favorite is the closer Marvin J, which weaves together the lyrics from I Know, Marvin Gaye's Sexual Healing, and... Get up, get up, get up, get up. Let's make love tonight. I don't know what that is, and honestly, I don't want to know. I don't want the magic to be ruined. I just think it is wild. In early 2015, De La Soul released... A Kickstarter. Yeah, they were going the fan-funded route for their next project. To be honest, I don't remember Kickstarter being a huge thing for music. I remember it being way bigger in gaming. This was going to be either De La Soul's Shovel Knight or their Mighty Number no. 9. Regardless, the Kickstarter proved very successful, with the project reaching its goal in under 10 hours. In April 2016, as an appetizer slash apology for delaying the album by a few months, we got the For Your Pain and Suffering EP. It's a nice little four-track teaser, though only one of the songs, Trainwreck, made it onto the upcoming album. The only place to listen to the whole thing as of now is on SoundCloud. Oh, we did get one other song from the gang before this new album dropped. Angry Birds Action, the Big Pig Update, with De La Soul. Soon the entire cartoon animal kingdom will be under De La Soul's control. De La Soul did a song for an Angry Birds game. It's a cute song, though I wouldn't remember it if it wasn't made for such a bizarre integration. Oh, or for this art. You know, I hope whoever made this art is doing well, and I hope that they're proud of what they made here. Me personally, though, I never want to see this again. I feel like these three things are going to haunt me in my dreams. In August 2016, De La Soul returned with and the anonymous nobody. I speak words real good like. This is going to surprise you, a De La Soul album is good. But this one is good in a way a De La Soul record hasn't been good before. For one, the production brings in live instrumentation for the first time since, I want to say Balloon Mind State, but I, I, I could be wrong about that. It's a shockingly diverse array of songs, taking cues from psych rock and p-funk. Even more specifically, strings. There are string arrangements all over this thing, which I'm always a fan of. You throw strings on it in Arby's, it's gonna feel like a cheesecake factory. All of this production serves to depict De La Soul as elder statesmen of hip-hop. On many of these songs, De La get to look back on their lives and careers, and the results are often quite moving. Royalty Capes sonically rolls out the red carpet, Lord Intended eventually morphs into an unearthed queen track, Pain has a funny synth line, Here and After sounds like an early 2010s alt-rock jam at certain points, and other tracks like Opener Genesis, Greyhounds, and the emotional closer Exodus demonstrate a mature confidence that makes for an excellent listen. By the way, if you want proof of how well-respected De La Soul are across all genres of music, you just have to look at this album's guest list. Snoop Dogg, Jill Scott, Rock Marciano, Damon Albarn, Estelle, Lil Dragon. Hell, in the span of three songs back-to-back, -back, you've got Justin Hawkins from The Darkness, and also YouTube these days, David Byrne from Talking Heads, and Usher 
from See Usher. You. Happy Easter, Xbox. And of course, we've got one skit, You Go Dave, which has one of the funniest lines ever on a De La skit. 16 handcrafted songs, sure to inspire and move you. I can't stop dancing! Watch me nene! And the anonymous nobody is a great time, one that puts a nice pin on De La Soul's career thus far, and potentially opens the door for a new, exciting era. Sincerely, anonymously, nobody. Since Nobody, De La Soul's output has been mainly as featured artists. They were on the song Moments off Gorilla's Humans in 2017, they were on Tom Mish's It Runs Through Me in 2018, a DJ Shadow song in 2019, and that basically brings us to present day, which means the only thing left to address is legal troubles. Alright, so. You may already know this, but over the past decade or so, nearly all of De La Soul's music was not on streaming services. The only records that were available were the ones made after they left Tommy Boy, so The Grind Date and And The Anonymous Nobody. The other records were still owned by Warner Records, who were apparently not willing to go through the trouble of revising contracts to allow for streaming access. Luckily, their catalog was purchased by the remnants of Tommy Boy Records, and De La Soul announced their music would soon be available to stream back in 2019. Once news came out about how De La Soul would get very little in royalties, talks seemed to stall for a few years. Eventually though, the catalog shifted hands again as Tommy Boy was purchased by Reservoir Media, and a deal was struck that pleased everyone as much as possible. And so, De La Soul's full catalog was finally made available on streaming in March of this year. Unfortunately, the return of De La Soul's music came soon after a tragedy. In February of this year, Dave passed away following battles with congestive heart failure. The final De La Soul song to feature Trugoy was Crocodilla's off this year's new Gorillaz album. Except, new things were teased by Prince Paul in late 2022. I don't know what this image means, maybe they were all in the studio to discuss timeshares. But just a few days ago, Maceo revealed that not only was a new De La Soul album on the way, and not only would Trugoy be on most of it, but it would be... Eh, two out of three ain't bad. For real though, putting aside my mixed feelings toward Mosaic Thump and Bionics, I'm happy any new De La Soul album is on its way. Plus, it's been over two decades since Bionics, so maybe they'll be taking a different approach to it? Wh whatever. Until that album comes out though, you can check out the full catalog of De La Soul made accessible for the first time in forever. If you want to get into De La Soul, no doubt at all, start with Three Feet High and Rising, please. After that, my personal favorites were Balloon Mind State, Stakes is High, The Grind Date, and the anonymous nobody, and first serve as a bonus. And if you have a favorite De La Soul song, album, related thing, I would love to know what it is in the comments.